so with 10 minutes, 5 minutes, and then we are all right. So, so we have 30 minutes to put in the question. So my name is Kyle McMartin. I work for Red Hat. Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Okay. My name is Kyle McMartin. I work for Red Hat. I, uh, I work on our ARM team, where I mostly work on ARM64, uh, tool chain and kernel issues. I've uh, been working at Red Hat for eight years now uh, in a variety of roles, mostly on the kernel, uh, as a kernel maintainer for Fedora and then for RHEL. Uh, before that, I worked at Canonical on Ubuntu, and then before that I was a Debian developer, so I've got a lot of experience uh, porting Unix software to a variety of esoteric architectures. Uh, I've been doing it for a very long time, about 15 years now. Uh, mostly I contributed to, to uh, Hewlett Packard's PA Risk uh, port to, of Linux to De or, uh, with Debian, and then the IS64 product as a result of that. Uh, and mostly now I've been working on ARM64, but I've touched on Spark and Alpha and 32-bit and, uh, ARM. And as I said, I've been working mostly on, on kernel and toolchain bugs, because low-level things like that are a lot more fun than <coughs> debugging Python code or something. So last year I gave a talk here about general portability, and it was a lot of, uh, you know, issues you might see writing C programs, uh, 
you know, things like uh, uh, alignment issues or, uh, you know, data type sizes and things like that. Uh, it was kind of low level and, uh, frankly, the audience seemed to be a bit glassy-eyed by midway through. And at the end, I sort of talked about how that all came together uh, and, and uh, resulted in build failures and things that I had to fix over the, the previous couple months. And everybody seemed very entertained by that because I, uh, I think I probably swore a lot and uh, was kind of grumpy about all the bugs I've had to fix. So I decided this year I was going to actually just, just talk about interesting bugs I've fixed in the last year. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that I, I realized that I'd gone through my old status reports where I'd said, you know, started working on bug XYZ. And it was, you know, usually a week or two or three before I actually had to bug the problem. And by the time I actually got around to fixing it and posting a patch, I realized that the patches were mostly just one line changes to fix these problems that had taken me three weeks to debug. And so I decided to just entertain you all by telling you about some really hilarious tool chain and kernel bugs that I've seen in the last year. And uh, maybe a bit about how, how I debugged them, and then, uh, I don't know, they're all pretty unique, so I don't know how, how useful it's going to be to anybody, but... At least it should, be, it should be at least be entertaining and you might have a laugh. So what am I speaking about? Generally, these are problems that Peter Robinson, who's probably in here somewhere, there he is at the back, or, uh, or a, a Fedora contributor who works for Red Hat named Paul Whalen have brought to me because they're basically the people behind uh, Fedora for ARM64 right now. And they'll usually find a fail to build from source when they're looking at the ARM Koji or some software is crashing while they're trying to run a compose. Something like that. I usually get a bug report or a ping on IRC saying something's broken. Take a look at it. So I'm going to talk about six main bugs today. Uh, these resulted in a mix of failures to the software at runtime. So it would run for a while, or not, but not to completion, and then dump out. Usually it wouldn't crash. Uh, this is a Python program in this case. It would hit an exception and then just you know, exit cleanly. Uh, one was a kernel panic that ended up being a CVE, and then several just resulted in seg faults and, and the program crashing. Uh, as I said, I'm going to hopefully try to use these bugs to illustrate some technical details that, that I, uh, sort of in the inverse order of the talk I gave last year, where I'll talk about some, some technical concepts that you might want to just not pay attention to if you don't want to. But I'm, I'm going to try to tie everything together. So the first bug I, I got, um, this was Anaconda falling over. And it was, in Py it was an Anaconda falling over in, uh, while loading, importing modules in Python. And the interesting thing about Python is that basically everything in Python ends up calling DL open every time you, you touch anything. So this started fine, kept running. You get most of the way through an install, and then suddenly Python crapped out. You get an exception, and your, your Anaconda didn't work. And the message was something I didn't really understand about at the time. Uh, this is a, approximately a year ago, probably a year ago, March. And it was uh, TLS exhaustion. You know, cannot, cannot allocate static TLS space. Uh, and then Python terminated. So this was coming from, uh, from glibc, from the dynamic loader. So what is TLS? TLS is thread local storage. It's basically a mechanism for individual threads to get access to their own private data that isn't shared between threads. So it's kind of like a per CPU uh, kernel structure, except that's for uh, the individual CPUs instead of a thread. There's two kinds of TLS, dynamic and static. Dynamic is slow, but it's the most flexible because uh, you look, you basically it calls a function, you, you uh, look up your pointer, you add that to what your thread base is, and then you, you get some memory, and you can just go with that. Static TLS is something you have to reserve at runtime, or at, at uh, startup time, i.e. when your program starts executing. And we can't really know beforehand how many things are going to deal open when you run a program. So we have to make guess and leave some space and hope for the best. So there's this option called TLS descriptors that were invented by Alex Oliva. So basically an optimization for dynamic TLS that you can get rid of that function call sometimes. Um, and the way it's implemented in glibc right now it greedily uses some of this static space uh, as an optimization. It's not uh, implemented anywhere but ARM64 right now. It, sorry, it's not actually enabled anywhere but ARM64 by default. Um, 
Why, I don't know. But when they, when they committed the port to GCC, to ARM64, they decided that this would be the default instead of the traditional model that everybody else uses and was well debugged. So the problem with that is if all the static TLS space is consumed, you can no longer DL open anything anymore. This had a trivial workaround where you, where you could um, always fall back to dynamic TLS, but obviously isn't optimal. Um, but it got Python and Anaconda going again. This is a one-line patch to the, the really core bits of GCC, or, uh, glibc's runtime uh, linker. This got Python going again, but it wasn't great. We can't get it upstream because it's kind of a hack. So a better fix, we could... Um, set a flag when we deal open, and then always fall back to dynamic TLS. So deal open things will be slow, but anything you statically linked against your binary will be fine, because when we, um, say when we, comp when we compile software into a shared library, uh, we'll know how much space that needs to consume in, t uh, in terms of data. And we can know that up front, because we you know, generate the, the list of mod or, uh, shared libraries you need when you run your program. So we can, we can know how much we need that in that case, but not in the deal open case where we you know, to just be running arbitrary things. So that was the first bug. Second bug was a kernel panic. I got a message, or a, a bugzilla assigned to me from, a, from a, uh, another Red Hat engineer where he DD'd one byte from, if, uh, from dev zero and the kernel panicked on him. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, not, <laughs> not really. It, it was, you could do this as a regular user and crash the, any, any, any ARM64 kernel. Uh, this was ideal in the sense that ARM64 wasn't exactly prevalent at the time. So this was about six months ago. Uh, not really a security risk in the, in the wild as a result of this, since you need local access to be able to do the one byte read from dev zero. But still, that was kind of funny. I was kind of curious how this could possibly be, uh, be the case. So analyzing this a bit further, it's got a, it's got a sign of CVE. I'm going to walk us through debugging this from the kernel, kernel dump that I got. So this is what the kernel panic looked like. Basically, it tells us that we uh, dereferenced an invalid address uh, in kernel space. So we got at the top the address it tried to access, uh, some stuff about the page tables that, that were used, um, some stuff on the task stuff. Then it tells us where the program counter was. That's you know, where the instruction that was executing at the time was the LR is the link register. It's where we would return to from that function call. Bunch of stuff on the register state, and then a call trace at the bottom that says we're in clear user, as the PC said. You know, walking back the stack, where we got to there from. So obviously, DD uh, reading from the device, so it's, this call is a read. And then some of the code that was executing at the time. And the bracketed one is the, the instruction that actually faulted. So walking through this step by step, what does this tell us? So the address it accessed is page aligned, so 64K aligned, so it's the first byte of a page, probably. Um, and it's a user address, so we know this because uh, all kernel addresses are uh, basically the negative of the positive. Uh, you know, it's the 64-bit address space, 63 bits for user space are the, with the top bit zero, and the kernel stuff is all from, you know, negative one and down. So they all, all the kernel addresses have FFFFE, if you go back and look at here. You can see all the, the task, the, the thread info struct, the task thread info link. Uh, all these are kernel addresses, the, the page tables, for instance. All, uh, all kernel addresses. OK. So the program counter is in clear user. This is a function that zeroes a string in user space. It's architecture specific, because everybody has to implement this themselves. Um, we don't really have a helper for that. It's just something that every architecture implements uh, to zero a string. And uh, the return pointer reads zero. This makes sense. We're calling, uh, we're, we're, you know, it's a, we're uh, accessing dev zero. So just having something like that in there makes sense. Then we get this, this code string. What does this tell us? Well, as I said, the bracketing one is the faulty construction. So we can decode this, store a byte to the address pointed to by x zero. And if you go back and look at x0, down there, 1c, c9, makes sense. That's exactly the as the kernel accessed. Everything seems pretty logical. OK. 
So I'm going to talk a bit about what this means to me as a kernel developer. So when we access user space, we, have, we use this optimization. Instead of uh, relying on, or instead of explicitly faulting things in, we just try them, and if they work, they work. If they don't work, we fix it up and then continue and replay the instruction. Cool. The problem is we have to tell the kernel to do this, otherwise any random fault could, you know, would have to uh, go through this, all this process. We don't want to do that. That's slow. We'd just rather, you know, kill the process. So we annotate these things with these, these user annotations. That says that we create a, we create a fix up in the fault table. Uh, to, um, if, it, if it fails, we branch this 9F. This will be an absolute label. We'll define that somewhere in our uh, assembly. It doesn't really matter. It just tells us what to do in, in case the instruction fails. Then the instruction to try. Pretty easy. We tag the, the um, address the instruction ends up in in the, uh, in the binary so that we know what, when we fault, that PC will be at some address. For instance, for this, this one, it would be uh, you know, a, few, a, a few instructions over where the fault actually was. And we hit that, we see, oh, it's in our table. Look it up, do the action, keep going. So in this case, the user annotation was missing on the single byte case. So that meant the kernel was just faulting and then falling over and panicking. Um, ironically enough, because any, basically any other access you could have done, and single byte accesses from dev zero, pretty rare. Uh, nine bytes would have been fine. Any multiple of anything that resulted in uh, a successful user uh, call being fixed up would have been fine because they would have faulted in the, pa the page that everything was on. So nobody, nobody noticed this forever until this bug report came in. Uh, I appear to have missed a slide here, but the, uh, the fix ended up being to add a user annotation uh, like, like the 9F one for the STRB zero case, or S STRB case to uh, just fix up the single byte case. Third, glibc crash. This is a crash. It was, uh, the, the build succeeded. It was running its test suite and generating locale data, and uh, the locale gen uh, program crashed. Okay, well, this is pretty new. They just rebased it to a new snapshot of upstream glibc's git tree. So first step, what, what changed? What's, what's going on? So I ran a git diff. Immediately, something obvious jumps out. There's a .s file added in the ART64 support. OK, that's pretty suspicious. It's probably going to be that, because I mean, all the rest of the stuff was saying you know, uh, x86-64 code or something like that. You know, just wouldn't cause a failure. Uh, on our error 64. So let's revert that commit and see. Boom, the build passes, test suite shows no regressions, locale data is generated fine, build succeeds. That looks pretty weird because the assembly code that got committed looks pretty reasonable. It actually matches pretty close to uh, something that was on the 32 bit ARM port already. You know, asked around, asked the author, he hadn't seen any issues. Okay, that's kind of weird. I guess I'll debug this further. So we have a crash. We now have a working case that doesn't crash with exactly the same glibc except for this one function reverted. So what do we do? We work backwards. It seems like the obvious thing to do. So I call this comparison debugging. This happens more often than not when people add assemb optimized assembly versions of functions to glibc, whatnot, what kernel. So I hacked glibc to generate both the assembler and the C version, and then added an environment variable that would toggle between the two. So I could run both in GDB, compare the state between the two at the time of the crash. So the problem is, you know, uh, a function call versus an assembly function, they're not, GCC will generate much different code than you would hand write because you're much more uh, likely to optimize certain things. And GCC has to be a bit more conservative because it, it, it doesn't know as many things as you might uh, about the context it's being called from. So I eliminated some skew. I don't actually have the dumps. I tried to find the bugzilla, but I couldn't find them. And I, so I compare the register, register state. Things look mostly reasonable. But something is funky. I compare the entry and exit of both functions and notice that this v15 register was different across one, but not the other. So v15 is a vector register. It wasn't, uh, 
it, was, it, was, it was actually explicitly annotated in the assembly to be used. So I kind of expected it not to, or to change in the, um, in the assembly optimized version. But it wasn't saved and restored by the function that it called it, and it wasn't saved and restored by the assembly function. So it's time to look up this, the ABI. I'm going to talk about ABI here for a second. ABI is basically what tells us the calling conventions for C. It allows, you know, I'm, I'm working on GCC, somebody else is working on LVM. We want to be able to link our code together and call between the two. So somebody has to write, sit down and write down a, a, a specification that tells us what registers do what so that we can, uh, you know, call each other properly. Basically it tells you where the, where the arguments are, what registers are used for that, where the stack is laid out so you can find things for other parameters and such, like, and, such and so forth. It also allows us to do these, do these optimizations. If we know we know only use certain registers in a function, we can flag those as being caller or callee saved. So we'll only call, or if, we'll rely on the person who calls us to save certain registers to avoid us having to do it, and vice versa. The function that calls us, can, uh, can, we can assure them that we didn't change anything by, call, or by saving them ourselves to the stack. So this basically avoids unnecessary saves and restores, which end up you know, accounting for a lot when you call a lot of functions. So on error 64, this v15 register ends up being callee saved. So the caller expects us to have saved and restored this so it would have the same value on both sides if we're going to use it. So <laughs> the fix being for this, a one-line patch to pick a different register because there's a whole pile of, uh, of uh, caller, or callee, yeah, caller saved registers. This gets confusing calling uh, these similar names. Pick a different one, everything works. Boom, done. That took a week to debug. Number four, GCC code generation. This is, this is a really weird one. Uh, libcapng, which is a, a C library for manipulating process capabilities. It failed in its test suite. Build worked fine. It actually worked fine if you disabled the test suite and just used it in practice, but the test suite started failing. Um, it uses TLS to store the thread caps, which we'll come back to in a second. And it was tickled by that Python fix I talked about with the static versus dynamic TLS. So it really wasn't immediately obvious to me how that fix could have broken it because it seemed pretty reasonable it had fixed the Python thing. I'd run it through the test suite. There was no regressions. Really not sure what was going on here, but I got curious. So back to dynamic TLS. As I said, it call, relies on a function call. Um, because of the way libcapng works, and this is actually, uh, I should say, um, DL open. So we're actually tickling the explicitly dynamic case of Python here because Python DL opens everything. So previously it would have used static TLS, which is fixed up at the start startup time. So it wouldn't end up making this function call. So let's figure out how we fell over. So, uh, I don't, somehow my slides have gotten out of order, I'm sorry. Right. Somehow something from further down the talk got here. Anyway. I'm really not sure what OpenOffice did to me here. <laughs> Anyway, I'll just try to press on. Anyway, the, uh, the problem here ended up being that, uh, that uh, we make this function call. As I said, we the caller and callee save things. Certain things we expect to be the same on both sides of a function call. In this case, um, the GCC was, had, a, had a bug in it. It wasn't properly... Um, clobbering a condition register. This is basically the thing that gets set. It's like flags on x86. It's what gets set to tell you that if uh, you do a comparison and you do, then do a branch instruction that you should take the branch versus not take the branch. It basically contains the conditional code. And um, to debug this, I ended up going through the, the GCC optimization pass until we figure out what the problem was. Look at the assembly output. Notice that in the failing case versus the non-failing case, a comparison was being moved to the other side of this TLS sequence. And the sequence is, is just basically like inline assembly that GCC inserts uh, when it generates these TLS accesses. 
So the movement of the comparison across the TLS sequence ended up being the problem. This ended up being a GCC bug. Um, when GCC inserts these things, it has, to, it has to tell you, or it has to know what it needs to invalidate between both sides of this so it can either save and restore them or do whatever it needs to do so that you don't, you know, when it inserts these things, this function call doesn't end up breaking the state of your program. So Richard Henderson found the bug in this in GCC and adds a, adds a um, clobber of the conditional, conditional registers so that we don't end up moving things on both sides of the sequence. That ended up fixing the problem. The problem is we just fixed a bug in GCC. We have no idea how many other broken pieces of software are in the distribution right now. So we need to rebuild everything with a new GCC to be able to get around this. That's kind of gross. So most or mass rebuilds kind of suck. I'm sure if Dennis is here, he knows why. Uh, yeah, well, that's Peter, but uh, mass rebuilds are awful. Um, we end up rebuilding everything, but we do it in a different order than it was actually built in the distribution. So things can start failing because we're now building with new versions of software that weren't there when they were originally built the first time. So if we want to avoid, if we can avoid it, we probably want to, and wait and do it, you know, when there's actually a really good reason to do it. So I wrote a glibc hack that's four lines long that saves and restores this condition code around the, uh, the uh, inside the uh, function call that, that I was talking about with the dynamic TLS. You can look at it here in the glibc source. It's pretty gross. It basically just saves this register to the stack and restores it again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. As, as, as soon as the mass rebuild happens, the patch becomes irrelevant. But it, it doesn't do any harm to have it there, and it doesn't actually make things much slower because it's only a single, uh, a single save and restore. Okay. How much time do I have left? Good. Good. This is Jeff Bastian. Hey, dude. Nice to meet you. So Jeff Bastian has actually been the thorn in my side. <laughs> He, uh, he finds a lot of bugs running, the, uh, running a bunch of test suites against uh, our ARM64 stuff. So he reported that th this uh, key control uh, commands were failing, but only if they had a page size minus one argument in terms of the, the, the key size. So that was really suspicious, because page size minus one is kind of a magic number if you, um, if you work on you know, kernel stuff. Uh, and it reminded me of a bug I talked about last year, which was... Uh, Stern and Lend from user, or a Stern and Lend user having it off by one and not handling it properly. Let's go back and look at that. Stern and Lend is a C function in user space. Basically, you pass it a string and a max size. It tells you the number of, it basically a uh, Stern S, uh, but only tells you up to max Lend. And if uh, it only looks at max bytes worth, or the Lend, max Lend of the string. So if the string ends up being longer than that, you truncate it. Uh, or you, you truncate the length at that max len. This is cool. This is pretty standard C function that's been around since 1979, probably. The kernel, on the other hand, decides to have this extra function called stern and len user, which does basically the same thing, but to a string that's supplied, or a string that's uh, a user string, which would have all the uh, complications of the uh, bug I was talking about earlier, where you had to, to uh, fix up the accesses. Anyway, the uh, kernel semantics are a little bit different. It includes the null, okay, that's one strike. Um, it returns max len plus one if the length of the string ends up being more than max len. And this is so you know that the string is longer than uh, the max len it would have truncated, because you know what you passed in. It returns one if, if uh, zero is null, because as, as it says there, it includes the null. So any code being written we need to take, advantage, or take, uh, take this into account because the user space one has different semantics. So if you code to the user space one, you'd expect uh, that, that third bullet point to be uh, zero. And it returns zero if the, the pointer is bad, so it doesn't actually do any of the accesses, or even if it does some of them. Uh, it doesn't matter what the length of the string is. If you end up hitting bad memory, or mem memory, invalid memory in there, it'll return zero. Or if max len is just weird, but that's not really a concern. So, the Stern and Lund user on ARM64 didn't actually handle this max plus one condition. It, it ended up truncating to max minus one. So anything that had a string where max len was equal to page size or page size minus one, and the string ended up being that long, uh, would end up truncating. So we had to handle that case, and everything started working as expected. But this is just you know another one of these little issues that uh, nobody expects, but when you start adding code 
that don't ha you don't test boundary conditions that come up. As I said, it illustrates the danger of similarly named APIs where you expect the semantics to be one thing because you're used to them from user space programming and then they're different in subtle ways and you don't exercise them properly. So I think it's really important if you're writing kernel code or any, basically anything that, that tries to implement something in an optimized way, you really have to exercise the, the boundary conditions of, you know, what if the string is this long and the, this argument is this, this way or whatnot. All right, bug number six. Flying through these. Uh, Richard Jones, who, yep. Is this a fixed bug? Yeah, this is fixed. Okay. This, is, this, is a, this is from uh, four months ago or something. So it's been a while. So Richard Jones reported that QMU on Rawhide was failing. And it, was, it was accessing a TLS variable. Seen, most of these seem to be TLS problems, which is fun. Um, it <laughs> failed and was built with, with, uh, as a position independent executable and with optimization but it succeeded when built without optimization. Okay, that's not a big deal. So I narrowed down the build flags that are used. Um, yeah, QMU hard codes this giant C flag string into its uh, spec file, and I you know, picked them one at a time to see which, which one was the problem. It wasn't optimization directly, it wasn't uh, position independent uh, uh, directly. But on a hunch, because it was a, when you, you looked at the core dump in GDB, it ended up being a, uh, a TLS access of the current CPU variable in QMU. I tried on a hunch to force a different model. Instead of using dynamic, uh, I forced it to use static TLS. And that worked okay. Okay, that's kind of strange. Uh, didn't really expect it. So this, as I said, local TLS uh, forces static TLS. And it means that, well, this kind of, esoteric technical details that aren't really important. But there's a difference between, if you, if you, um, if you generate static TLS up front, things aren't laid out in the binary the same way as they would be if you optimize for it. Uh, because we'll have these uh, slots in the GOT for, uh, that are used to do the TLS stuff. I would, really shouldn't have put this slide in here, but whatever. Um, the, the global object table is this thing that shared libraries and, and position independent executables will use. It's basically a list of addresses that let you, let you find data um, without hard coding the, access or the address inside your, your program. And we need to do this because you can't fix up, uh, if you've ever seen text rel bugs on uh, when you're working on code, basically you, re you really can't patch um, a binary at runtime because it would defeat the purpose of being able to share pages, read-only code pages between multiple copies of you know, glibc or ls or xwindows or whatever you want, to, whatever you're running. So it's it's the important important part. Dynamic TLS uses extra entries. Usually, you just have one entry that tells you know you access you, your load goes through the GOT, tells you where where the data is. Dynamic TLS uses an extra entry for some housekeeping information so you can actually find the thread local storage. And Bin Utils is misaccounting for this size on AR64. So back to QMU. Debugging QMU and GDB, we're looking through the GOT, and the addresses look really, really weird. We're expecting it to look like this TLS thing, but it ends up not being, uh, not being the case. So, uh, testing dis different flags that uh, we end up uh, using when we build the thing. We found, I found one in Binutail's comb, comb relock, which basically reorders the relocation table for op uh, to be more optimal so you can apply similar relocation at the same time. This fixed the bug, which was really unexpected because it had nothing to do with optimization or position independent executables or anything like that that we thought up front. It ended up being bin details, the culprit. There was an off by one. Uh, it, was, it was off by one in accounting for the size of the GOT on Air 64. That ended up being a one line fix to, <coughs> excuse me, to size it properly. And that got things back working again because it was, no, was now sorting the entire got properly instead of missing some entries and ended up and ending up that you were pointing into bogus memory when you were trying to uh, look up that TLS variable. That's it. Uh, any questions? Yep. I have to ask if it is possible to buy some ARM64. Yeah. Uh, the Just for you bet if you have square one thousand dollars, yeah. you can. Yeah. And so uh, it's cheaper like for the race, 
ARM is coming out with these Juno platforms that are supposed to be quite inexpensive. I don't know if they're available. I would not say that Juno would be inexpensive. Well, relatively compared to yeah. compared to Mustang, um, you can buy Applied, Applied Micro will sell you a Mustang system, which is a fairly powerful server class uh, ARM sixty four machine uh, for, as, as Marcin says, about a thousand dollars. And um, yeah. I think low power, no, 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 no low power yet. Those are coming. You can you can buy Nexus nine tablet <laughs> and yeah. try to hack it as a developer. Yeah, that is a it's MV, it's, it is MV8, it runs Linux with Android. You can run in change root or something, you can run in the MV8 distribution. Yeah, basically, at the moment, there's nothing announced, but watch news please um, over the next few months, and you should see uh, some more interesting. I will see weeks. Yeah, there should be a lot of interesting hardware coming out soon. Yep. Yes and no. Uh, the TLS stuff ends up ended up being quite uh, no, actually quite relevant for everybody else because they all shared the same, rel relatively the same code in glibc. Uh, the assembly would obviously be written in a different for a different architecture, but the bugs were the same. Um, the only reason they didn't see it is because they use a more uh, they use the uh, the original TLS model as opposed to this TLS descriptor model. Um, and there's actually probably going to be a push to move, because it's more optimal uh, in the, uh, the worst case, the dynamic case, which is uh, the common case for most, most software. Uh, there'll actually probably be a push to move x86-64 to this, which is and since we've shaken down, down these bugs, we should you know, be better off there. But in the general case, five out of six of these bugs were in code that's explicitly written for uh, ARH-64 or in... Um, yeah, you know, in files that are, you know, foo ar64.c or whatever. <laughs> yeah, um, The common case for a lot of bugs is, I mean, as when we were building, bringing up uh, ARC64 and Fedora and Pharrell, we, we saw a lot of, you know, here's this giant chain of if defs for PowerPC and S390 and x86 and i64 and all whatever, whatever, whatever. And those are, you know, they end up being important in the sense that the software may have run without that set for ARC64, but it ended up crashing in some subtle way as a result of it. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. Um, I don't know. Um, a lot of a lot of the portability bugs really got sh got get shaken out early because AR64 is not that much different than you know any other 64-bit architecture. It's little endian. It's pretty sane. Um, it actually fixes a lot of the really weird things about ARM. Uh, so there wasn't there isn't too much, you know, broadly speaking, portability bugs left. It's mostly just these really strange issues that you end up getting by, you know, when you add, start adding all this, all these, you know, thousands of lines of code that are specific to a certain thing. And another thing we've seen a lot of is really a lot of firmware bugs. Yeah. That, yeah, you know how it is. There's a ton of firmware bugs that appear to be a kernel bug or something else that in the end end up being firmware and or just how they interact together. So Absolutely. That's a huge part is really crappy. Yeah. Was there a question back there at some point? Or? Nope. Are we all good? Thanks very much. I was just wondering uh, what kind of qualifications would you need for a job like yours or similar? 
I don't know. Uh, I mean, like, patience look, look, mostly. No. Uh, uh, looking at like a resume or something. Uh, honestly, it's it's hard because I don't. I, I know it's a hard weird. joke. No, 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 not just. I mean, it's it's hard, but it's it's a lot of temperament, right? It's like being able to debug things. I don't. If you're a C programmer, I'd look at your resume. Or if you have assembly experience, I'd look at your resume. Sorry. No, no. I'm sorry. If you worked on uh, anything like a JIT or something like that, definitely look at your resume. Yeah, like a, a just in time compiler. All right. I would. Honestly. No. Not yet. We'll probably see that soon. Yeah, or. Um, LLVM does one, yeah, you know, right. Right. and uh, GCC is now having a JIT, so it's, any experience with anything like that would just, I mean, it's just, it's architecture stuff, right? It's, it's being able to debug C code is really important. Other than that, it's something that you really, I wouldn't ever not hire someone because of the resume. It would always be, uh, I try to have a, you know, when you interview them, it would be a lot of problem solving questions, not like, um, the kind of Google questions, but like, what's your debugging methodology? How would you, you know, here's the, the panic you got or whatever. Tell me what you can, what, what would you guess based on this? And that's the kind of thing I would ask. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to be, no. I mean, uh, that's where I came from. That's like, you are, like, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, if you want to, if you want to talk about jobs, you can send me an email. We're definitely hiring soon. Yeah, I'm not sure about soon. Sure. But yeah, I need to complete some project. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I was looking into that. I, like, I'm very interested in that. Yeah. Like, so no mainstream, like, so far not so mainstream architecture. I'd be happy to talk to you by email. Okay. Going forward. Okay. I'm pretty, I'm pretty responsive by email usually. I just got to put my stuff away. For this. Yeah, sure. Zásuvku nahoře, ale já mám na myslení krátky. Dobrý, jo, to bude. To je to vždycky komplikované.
five. Should be on this corridor. No idea.